Daniel 3, chapter 16 through 28. You know, Daniel was a true man of God, and he had three young men who were with him that were also true men of God. They would not compromise on what God had told them that they should do. When they were taken captive, and they were given food, wine, drink, they said, no, we can't, we can't eat this stuff. We can't drink this stuff. This, this is not what God has got for his children to do. You know, give us hopes and give us water. That's all we need. And the Lord gave them favor, and they did well. And they prospered in the kingdom, but it came a time, you know, when the folks that were around them, you know, you may have people that like you, but situations change, and they get a little higher up than you, and they think you a little bit less, that they were requested or required to do something that was totally against their way of living. This is Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael was their real name, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was their Babylonian names. And they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand. That's pretty good confidence, eh? But, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship thy golden image, which thou hast set up. Oh my. You mean they took a stance for God. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his vestments, his face, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and therefore he spake and commanded that they should be cast, they should heat up the furnace one seven times. Now, a lot of folks won't say that's a seven times hot. I think that's 17 times hot. Because they sometimes will say 21, one seven times. Anyhow, however hot it was, it was too bad for some folks. One seven times more than it was wont to be headed or eating. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in other words, he put them in handcuffs, so to speak, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, in their hoses, in their hats, and their garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Can you imagine being so close to a fire that it would actually suck the breath out of your lungs. That's basically what it did. You know, when you get too close to the fire, it generates a suction, and it'll pull your oxygen right out of your body. It suffocates you. But the heat, the flames, destroy those people. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and it must have been a pretty good size opening on that door because he could see what was going on in there. And goes up and spake and said unto the counselor, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Woo! Hallelujah! And walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. Can you imagine that? I think you know, I, I, in my foolishness back in the days of my drinking and stuff, I, I, I walked down in the midst of a bonfire until my boots were starting smoking, you know. But a fire that hot, I can't imagine it. Walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, I wonder how the king never could ever do that. There was something different about that guy. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fire furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth. Come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was their hair singed. Now, I remember, you know, back in the day when I was smoking, and I had a lighter sometime and had a beard like this, it singed my hair. Or you go out and you put some stuff in a, a big 50-gallon uh, barrel and burn it, and maybe throw a little bit of uh, castor, kerosene in it or gasoline, and you screw down here and throw a match in the go. And burn your face here, you know. I mean, it gets you good. Neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed off them. I, I just dare you to walk into any of these convenience stores downtown. Whatever they are cooking in there, you're going to come out smelling like that. Can you imagine that? Not having any of that smell on you. I can. I actually experienced that down at the camp meeting when the fire, the flames from the fire came up between my legs and across my body and it didn't burn me. I got a picture of this. It's a, it's a way my wife was up here taking pictures. I didn't know. I was just preaching. But the, the Lord, I asked him before the service, I said, Lord, I want you to send an angel. I want you to work mighty things in this long life. You know, when, when uh, the angel came down to the Manoa and them, and, and they made up uh, an offering for him, and he got up and went up to the flame of the fire. I said, I want you to send a, an angel to work wondrously in, in this bonfire today. And he did. And I didn't have no smell of smoke on I wasn't burned, nothing on my clothes was burned whatsoever. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and had changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Hallelujah. That's good news. You know, the scripture says, the angels of the Lord encamp around about them that fear him. Solomon said, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. When the righteous saints love the Lord and endeavor to keep his commandments, and really, when they see sin, it makes them feel bad inside. You know, that's what it's called to hate you, to hate sin. He blesses his children and he takes care of them. We might not see those angels like the kings are, but they're there. If the Lord would open our eyes like he did the servant of Elijah, We'll be able to see. There is more with us than there is against us. Because we've been set free through the blood of Jesus. Psalm 16, 12 says, Thou hast caused men to ride over my heads, our heads, pardon me. And we went through the fire, through the water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. Now what he's talking about when the children of Israel was walking through the wilderness. You know, the flame of the fire went before them at night, bowed by day. And they went through all that. And they went through the Red Sea. And they went through the Jordan. Both times, the water opened up. And they walked on dry ground. That's amazing. You know, how in the world can you do that? That, you know, if you think about it, when water is running down a sloop, and you stop it here, the water down there disappears. I mean, it's gone. But he said he had a wall on both sides of it. It stayed there. The water was flowing, but it wasn't in its place. I guess it must have either been going over their heads or underneath the ground one, because it, 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 it had to do something to have it standing there like that. God was an awesome God. He brought them through everything. That should have killed them. But they and the thing that they passed through killed their enemies. 
Think about this, you know, when we see a tornado coming, we get a little fearful because we know the damage that it can do. But yet the prophet Elijah, when it comes time for God to take him away from his ministry, he went up in a whirlwind. Where he put him, I don't know. But he put him somewhere because he wrote about, you know, 13 years later, he wrote a letter to the king. But he just wasn't in full time ministry. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. I can't speak. You will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. One scripture says, No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. That's freedom. But we have to stay in the will of the Lord to have the blessing of that fruit. Daniel 6 and 5 and 16, 22, it says, 16 through 22, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against Daniel. This is talking about Daniel. Except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now you think about that today. What would people do to find something against you and I that concerning our God. Well, one of the first things I can say is the Sabbath. You know, we're going to have this thing on Saturday and you have to be there, otherwise you don't get your whatever you need. Are we going to compromise and go? Hello? Because if we do, then we just fail God. We missed out on the blessing. We, we cannot expect to have the same results that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have, and we cannot expect the same results that Daniel had. Except we find against him concerning the law of his God. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. It wasn't a lion's den, it was a den of lions. In other words, you can have a lion's den and not be nothing there. I, I, I kind of think when it comes time to sleep, you probably lay down right on top of them. You know, I, I see people working with lines and things like that, and they just wallow all over them and have a good time. And won't, won't it be wonderful when Jesus comes and the creatures like that don't hurt us no more? And the little children who go out there and play with them just like they do with their kitten. Ooh, that's going to be wonderful. Now the king spake and said unto them, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. You see, the king didn't want to uh, do anything to Daniel because he liked him. It was just the jealous folks that want to do something. There's always somebody that's jealous of God's children and wants to get them caught up in something. Where you're working, whatever you do, trying to get you to fix. Thy God, whom thou servest, can service continuing that he will deliver you. Here, here's the man that wasn't a, a, a righteous man, according to the scripture. A heathen. He said, your God can save you. But he didn't leave it just at that either. We're going to see and find out. And he put legs on that. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the dead, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of the Lord's that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. You see, they, they fashioned their laws after God. You see, God said, I am God, and I change not. And when the king stood some stamp it with his heel, he said, that's law, it can't be changed. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. He didn't eat, he didn't drink, neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. In other words, he was praying for Daniel. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice. He wasn't really quite sure. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, it is thy God whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut 
the lion's mouth. That they have not hurt me, for as much as before him, innocence he was bound to me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Hallelujah. Can, can we truly say that in our own heart? We need to be able to say it's going to be done. That's why it's so important. Paul said, I died daily. That means that he went before the Lord daily to confess his sins before the Lord in the name of Jesus, asking for forgiveness of sins. Every time you see the old man dies, the new man comes alive. 2 Corinthians 2 9 says, For to this end also I did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in just a few things. No, all things. Now here is where it separates the true believer from those that are just going on along for the ride. Are you obedient in all things? You know, if, if you truly believe something, are you living it? But if, if you're walking out in the world and the people say, well, you believe this, you, you hear you're doing that, which is this, your belief isn't really very good, is it? You're compromising. When I, I'm one of the people that uh, I follow the, the dietary laws of God, I don't eat anything that he determines as being unclean. And I'm very meticulous about this. When I go to a restaurant, people don't like to go to the restaurants with me because I don't know if everything's cooked in, what's got in it, and so forth and so forth, you see. And the same thing for the grocery store. I, I pick it up, I read the labels. And I, one time I was, I was going to buy this uh, fudge brownie. And I'm reading along there and it said vegetable mono and diglycerides. And I said, hmm. If that says vegetable mono and diglycerides, what is this one over here that just says monodiglycerides? You don't have vegetable in front of it. So I had my wife write a letter. I said, from what source or sources was the monodiglycerides derived from? They write me back, it's derived from the pig. And here in Arkansas, they had, uh, what was that bread, honey? Um, colonial bread. Right on the front of it, big letter, big one zero zero percent made with one hundred percent pure vegetable oil. But in it, it had just plain mono and diglycerides. I picked up the phone and called to phone the place up there. I said, I want to know from what source or sources this mono and diglycerides is from. Oh, that, that comes from the pig. But yet your things are just made from 100% pure vegetable oil. Well, the oil that they used was, but this monoline diglyceride, which is an oily substance, wasn't. So sometimes we are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I used to eat pizza and it made me sick. And I said, Lord, you know, why, why is this? You know, I eat meat pizza with hamburger on it and tomatoes and olives, you know, why is it making me sick? He says, well, when they put the pizza in here, they put another pizza here beside it. This has got sausage pieces on it. Yours has got hamburger on it. The heat's going to make those sausages bubble and it's going to get on your, 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 your pizza too. So I stopped eating pizza. And then I got to the place that, that uh, people were telling me about ingredients in the food, cheese. Did you know the cheese has got pork in it? I said, you're crazy, man. Cheese comes from a cow. Oh, but they got a little substance in there called rennet that causes the cheese to coagulate and get in a brick. Most of the time, it comes from the pig. I said, well, you're out of your mind. Sure enough, we wrote the companies and they tell us that. Well, what about the gum you're chewing, they says. What are you talking about? I was chewing regular gum. I chew it for a few minutes. I get a little sick and I spit it out. And it's upset my stomach. Wrigley's chewing gum had pork in it as a softener. I said, man, what, what is all this stuff? You know, how can this be? But see, Daniel and his brethren were so meticulous that they would not defile themselves with the king's meat. 
They wouldn't bow down and, and serve his God. They wouldn't, no doubt, wouldn't work on the Sabbath day either. You see, because they were obedient to his word. And that's what we've got to do. If we compromise God, one day when we need it, he may allow us to be compromised. Amen. Second Corinthians said, For to this end did I write that I might know the proof of you. This is good news, saints. Really, it is. It's good news to know that we have an opportunity to get it right. Have you learned to all do the problem correctly? Or are you just writing down the answer that somebody else gave? I, I tell the students at school, and I says, you know, if you're letting the student next to you help you do that work, or you're copying off of what they're doing, I said, it's kind of like this gentleman over here, he wants to increase his muscles by 50%, but I'm lifting the weights. It ain't helping him none at all. I'm the one that's getting it. I said, you need to exercise your brain. And we need to exercise the Word of God because it's in the Word of God that we find liberty. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 7, 39 says, The wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. And now you can say, if the husband is a sinner, he's really dead in God's eyes. So maybe it might be a little something to think about. But we, as long as we are alive in Christ Jesus, we are bound by His Word. It's only when we step out of the highway of holiness and get into sin and begin to live in sin that we're no longer bound by His Word because what's going to happen is we're going to be judged by His Word. And His Word is true. And the truth is of no part of a lie. It just ain't got no falsehood in it at all. To have a lie in truth defeats our liberty. So we must buy the truth, get it, and sell it not. Hang on to it. Don't let it go. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to marry whom she will. Only, listen to this, only in the Lord. Now you look at this bicep and you're going to over here. One of these days she's going to be thinking about getting married. Now, you think she's going to go out to the local graveyard and dig up some guy that used to be really handsome and take his bones and carry them up to the preacher or whoever and say, marry me to these bones? No. That's foolish, you say. Nobody in their right mind would do that. But if she's a born again, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, saint of God, and she goes out here and dates this sinner and marries him, she just married a dead person. And when we do anything that's contrary to God's word, we have a just recompense of reward that's going to hurt us. Oh, there's a chance that she might be able to witness enough to him and get him to come to Christ. But there's also a chance that he can put enough pressure and love on her to get her to compromise God. You see? If, if, the, if the leaders there in Daniel's time could have gotten him to compromise and say, oh, hey man, just, just don't do this. This time today. Do you think he'll be able to live in the life then? My dad one time read a story about a man who was over in a communist country and he was a Christian. And they arrested him like they did many Christians. And see, the communists in that place, they wore certain clothing to identify who they were. And he was in prison for quite a while. They beat him, they starved him, they did all kinds of stuff to him. And, and the jailer said, if you will just let us put these clothes on you and let you stand up in front of the people so that they can see that you're wearing these clothes, then we'll let you go. He says, no. 
He says, if you put them on me with whatever strength I've got, I'll be trying to get them off. You see, we cannot afford to allow sin on our bodies to bind us up. You see, because Jesus, through his blood, has separated us from our sins, and he doesn't want us to be bound in sin anymore. But if you entertain it, if you play with it, it'll get you. Sure enough, it'll get you. You get too close to a snake, it can bite you. Or anything else that's harmful, it can get you. No, he says. Saints or Christians are considered to be alive and sinners are considered to be dead. You know, when we were dead in our sins, the scripture says, but now are we alive through Christ Jesus. Romans 7, 1. Know ye not, brother, for I speak to them who know the law. I dare say that Probably the biggest majority of people that call themselves Christians don't have any idea about what the law is. I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. Well, once you die, once you bury somebody, it don't matter what the laws of the land are. It doesn't bother them anymore. If you're living in sin, it don't matter what God's word says because you don't have to live by them. You're living by a different code. But in the day of judgment, that word is going to judge us. Whether or not we have done according to his word. If Christ Jesus be in us, then we are alive from sin. We're no longer sinners. We're alive in Christ Jesus. He has made us the righteousness of God in himself. So we're supposed to live a righteous life as best we can. Oh, I, I'm sure that we all fall short from time to time. Just like these children, you dress them up nice, they get out and play, they get dirty, you have to clean them up. We get out in the world and live in our life, and sometimes a little bit of sin gets a hold of us. That's why we need to die daily and go before the Lord and pray and ask for forgiveness. And say, Lord, you know, I'm tired of committing this same sin over and over again. Help me to get away from this thing. Do something, Lord, where I don't have to do this no more. Saints are bound to the law, sinners are bound to Satan. Plain and simple. Whosoever you serve, that's who you serve. Romans 6 13. Neither ye of ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Any portion of who you are should not be dabbling in any kind of sin, regardless of what it is. But yield yourselves unto God. I mean, just throw up your hands, you know, it's a high surrender. Do like Jesus and be nailed to the cross. I surrender. You can't do anything. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of what? Righteousness. Unto God. People don't think, you know, you can't live a righteous life. You can't live a holy life. Would you ask them children to do anything that was impossible for them to do? No. No, unless you're playing. God ain't playing. Jesus said, be ye holy as your Father in heaven is holy. We have a commandment. Just like thou shalt not steal, we're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be righteous. And the way we are made righteous is by living by the written word of truth. Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Revelation 22 21. Doing the truth won't save us. In other words, I, I could go to any college and sit down and, and listen to all the lectures, take all the tests, but unless I pay the fee, I don't get the degree. And the fee for our sin is the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. If we accept him, 
as our Lord and Savior, if we confess our sins to Him and He forgives us of our sins, then we are responsible to live the life that He lived. He said, I am your example. Follow me. If you all know how to live a righteous life, just see what Jesus did and do the same. Mary said it, that's the first miracle that Jesus did. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And it's still going today. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. If you'll do it, you'll be free from punishment. If you're not disobedient, you won't have to worry about getting home. If you don't break the speed laws, you won't have to worry about getting a ticket. It's when we break the law that we're bound by the law. When I worked in the prosecutor's office, I said, hey, you know, I, I, I didn't want to arrest you. You asked me to arrest you. You know the same thing. When we break the law, we are inviting them to arrest us. Or well, we're hoping that they don't. <laughs> but we are actually inviting them. I said, hey, look, if you go to rent a house, and it ain't got no utilities in it going. You think the electric company's going to come out there and turn on your electricity? The gas company's going to come on and turn on the gas? The water company's going to turn on the water without you asking for them and paying the fee first? Ain't going to do it. You have to ask for it. And the way for us to stay free from the law of sin and death is to be obedient to the law. No, saints are alive to the Spirit. It's in the Spirit of God that we're made alive. Hallelujah. And, and His Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do things that we couldn't normally do, to say things that we couldn't normally say. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But there is also a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we need that too. Some people get it just as soon as they, they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Or we get some new in his household. But some of them don't get it until somebody comes along and lays hand on them in the name of Jesus and gives it to them. But what God has got to give you and I is what we need to make it through this life. We need everything. Every tool that Jesus has to give his children, we need it to make it through this life not to be worried about sin. If, if you're out here and you're have, running a business, I mean a multi-million dollar business, you've got to have a good attorney to keep you out of lawsuits. We've got an excellent attorney that's never lost a battle, Jesus. And he's interceding for us, you and I, right now, for the Father. And Satan's bringing up all kinds of evil reports. But we're not bound by those reports because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. 2 John 2, I mean, 2 John 1, 6. And this is love. That we walk after his commandments. If you love me, do what I say. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, oh, you should walk in it. It's something that we have to do. Loving God is an action word. Faith is an action word. It's something that you have to do, apply it in your life to make it work. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they had to apply that thing. Even though we know that God can deliver us, even if he don't, I won't. We need to get that mentality in us so that we won't have to worry about being bound in sin again. 1 John 3 and 4 said, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. People want to say the law is doing away with it. All you have to do is believe. That's cool. But if there ain't no law, you can't sin. You go to a, a, a country that don't have any speed laws, you can drive as fast as you want on the highway. And there are some places like that. No speed laws. You can drive 30 miles an hour, you can drive 100 miles an hour. It don't make no difference. But when you've got speed laws 
and we break those laws, and those little lights come flashing up behind us, then we're going to have to pay the penalty. And that's the same way with God's Word. If we intentionally break God's laws, and the breath of life leaves our body before we can go before the Father in the name of Jesus and ask Him to forgive us of our sin, you think we're going to make it into God's kingdom? Our God don't change. Over in Ezekiel 44, chapter, over there, the third chapter, he says, My ways are equal. I say, if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do righteousness, he will no longer die in his wickedness. But if a righteous man turn from his righteousness and do his wickedness and die therein, I'll get the other word righteous. A hallelujah. We've got the Holy Spirit around here kind of pulling on our shoulder a little bit to get our attention to hang upon you're getting a little out of step, buddy. You're, you're stepping out of your place of freedom to a place of getting bound again. First uh, Peter 1.25 But the word of the Lord endures forever. Hallelujah! It endures. You know, nothing lasts forever. You know, they used to make uh, appliances and automobiles and stuff like that that live and work for a long, 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 long time. But now they break fix them before they break down sooner so you can buy something new again. But God didn't make nothing like that. He made His law and His word to where it lasts forever. You can always trust it. He won't change it in the middle of the situation. 1 Timothy 1, 8. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Now, if it's good, why would you want to change it? No. My watch is good. Why would I want to go buy a new one? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinner, for the unholy, for the profane, for the murderers of fathers, the murderers of mothers, for the manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's what the law is against. That's who it's for. But for us, the law is liberty. It helps us to stay free from death. Free from condemnation. Free from guilt. We're no longer bound. We're free. Hallelujah, I'm free! I tell you what, you get locked up in jail for a few days, and you just about kiss the ground when you come out. They don't have to mistreat you. It's just not a pleasant place to be. They tell you when to go to sleep and when to wake up. They tell you what you can eat and what you can't eat. When you can shower. When you can go to the bathroom. But as long as we're free, we can do whatever we want to when we want to. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. If we don't have any law, we don't have any strength. You see, the power and the authority of Little Rock, Arkansas, or the state of Arkansas, or the United States is in its laws and their ability to enforce those laws. And that's the same way with God. He has laws and he has ability to enforce those laws. And one day he shall enforce those laws. Without law, we have no government. We have no authority. Survival of the fittest. You know, whoever's the strongest. I can take from you, you can take from me. But there's nobody to protect us but ourselves. But with the law, 
how free from you coming into my house and stealing my goods. Because I have reflex. I can have you arrested. They tell me, no bad checks on her. That's a federal offense for a mailbox. A class C felony. Punishable up to 10 years in prison. Just by doing things that they should not do. And the law is there for a purpose. But you know why we have so much lawlessness going on today? Because the laws are in place. You see, if when somebody committed murder or rape or kidnapping, they killed him, people would get the idea, hey, I don't want to do that. If when people stole, like they stole several hundred dollars from her, and they were forced to pay back double. Why in the world would they want to do that? Well, I'll just work to save my money because I'll have to work to pay her back double. That don't make no sense. Our, our laws for our land have got crazy. I mean, they just don't work properly. You know, people they make this habitat for humanity. They give people houses and all. If the adults, the woman and the man, is going to get that house, goes out and works on that house, when they move into it, they, when, when Johnny or Susan does something wrong in the house, try and tear things up, hey, look, I, I just fixed that myself. But if you just give it to them, I don't break it if you want to, the government's going to give me another one. If people continually get away with doing wrong, they will have a propensity to do wrong. If you always answer the question wrong, guess what? You're always going to answer the question wrong. We're creatures of heaven. But I am so thankful that our Heavenly Father and a creature. And His habits are all good. He is a spirit. He is a peace. He is light. In him is no darkness, neither even burdens, nor shadow and turn. You know why there's no shadow and turn? Because there's no light greater than him. It's only the lesser light that passes the shadow of the light shine. How do we free? Are we free? Do you feel like we're free? I do. Amen. I am totally, completely free. Hallelujah. I am ready to read Jesus. We need to have that confidence in our life. Every day. If, if I breathe out, and I can't breathe in no more, I know that I'm going to be talking with Jesus. That is the kind of freedom we need to have in our lives. Make it a question.